Hi, uh, I'm Rachel Beyer, the John W. Emery Family Assistant Curator of Oral History at History Colorado. And I'm here today with Judge, uh, Judge Jerry, uh, sorry, excuse me, Judge Gary M. Jackson. Uh, today is June 1st, 2021. And we are here uh, to talk with Judge Jackson about uh, Lincoln Hills uh, and his, his law career, as well as some, some other things that he may wanna share with us. So thank you, uh, thank you Judge Jackson for, uh, for sharing your story with History Colorado. We really, really appreciate it. I'm excited to have your story in our collection. Um, let's start off by, uh, uh, your family has a really long involvement with Lincoln Hills. Um, would you start off by sharing perhaps maybe one of your earlier memories of being at Lincoln Hills? Well, Rachel, thank you. Um, when you talk about one of my earlier memories at Lincoln Hills, um, it probably would be when I was um, three or four years old. And uh, that would have been 1948. 49. And um, I can remember that uh, uh, my family, we would go to Lincoln Hills uh, almost every weekend from Memorial Day until uh, uh, Labor Day. And um, the reasons that we would uh, go during that period of time was that the, the roads were dirt. And uh, because of the uh, winter weather in Colorado, the only time that it was really accessible to us would have been between basically May 31st, uh, Memorial Day, until approximately Labor Day, uh, when the snow would start falling again. And so um, our trips to uh, Lincoln Hills was always a family trip where it would be my grandfather, grandmother, uh, maybe a couple of uncles, my mom and dad, my brother and I. And uh, we would make that uh, trip from uh, our home on 3rd and Garfield Street to Lincoln Hills. And what I remember is, uh, is we would leave on a Friday. Uh, typically, it would take about four hours to get to uh, the cabin from uh, um, uh, our, our home in, on Garfield Street, uh, where today uh, that trip would take uh, from doorstep to doorstep about 55 minutes now that the highways are paid. And um, uh, during the trip, uh, what was always memorable to me was that there would be certain switchbacks that were a single lane dirt road that uh, my grandmother would have uh, the grandchildren get out of the car and my grandfather would be driving the car with uh, the German Shepherd Sandy in the car. And it was my grandmother's concern that if, uh, if the car went over the cliff that uh, the children would not be harmed because we were walking around these switchbacks and uh, uh, my granddad would be driving the car with the dog so that if, if the car went over the cliff, at least he had Sandy uh, with him uh, on, on the fall over the cliff. So uh, that, was, that was always a particular memory because there would be six or seven of us in the car and uh, and I'm gonna excuse me, I turned off my phone so that we won't be interrupted again. But um, that was a particular memory was just the, the drive. You know, another particular memory was that um, um, uh, our very first stop coming from Denver to uh, 
uh, to get to the cabin would be in Pine Cliff. Pine Cliff had a post office. They had a uh, little grocery store. And, um, and so that would be the first stop that we would make during a, a four hour ride. I learned later uh, that um, uh, we never stopped in Wonderview because Wonderview was a Jim Crow town and that uh, the grocery store uh, that was in um, Wonderview was not available to us uh, because we were black. And so uh, it was later that I learned that uh, the reason that we would not make our first stop was um, was because of the Jim Crow policies of Wonderview. Um, a particular memory, and I think I, sh I showed you a, a photograph, was a photograph of my brother and I at the age of probably four and three, uh, playing in front of a, a, a large rock that was right in front of the cabin. And uh, for us, uh, what the the mountain experience was was um, was just joyful you know playing uh, in the mountains uh, uh, hiking in the mountains uh, there was a creek called the South Boulder Creek that uh, 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 was probably 50 yards in front of our cabin to the to the uh, to the west of our cabin going to the creek skipping rocks uh, uh, across the creek, or even going over the railroad tracks so we could get across the creek and go over to the ponds. There were, there were ponds that uh, uh, were available for uh, either uh, fishing or uh, uh, just uh, wading in the ponds. Um, I can remember probably my teenage years having a, um, a Red Rider BB gun and um, being able to uh, shoot that BB gun uh, up in the up in the mountains and uh, to to shoot at trees or at rocks or at chipmunks uh, and that this was uh, such a fun experience uh, as a teenager because. Uh, uh, that was something that you couldn't do in 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 the city, but um, but the the memory is is a memory of uh, just uh, having uh, a joyful experience. Uh, we would uh, uh, the cabin was probably 400, 500 square feet at the most, but there was a wood-burning stove in the cabin. My grandmother uh, in the morning would get up early and she would cook on that wood-burning stove. So she'd make biscuits and fry bacon and eggs and um, and then we would have a, a early morning breakfast. And then uh, once we had breakfast, it was just roaming the mountainside until uh, we would hear the cowbell ring at noon, where we would, when we heard that cowbell ring, we would come back to the cabin and have lunch. We'd have lunch uh, and then once again, uh, start roaming the mountainside uh, until we heard the cowbell again at around six o'clock to return to the cabin and have dinner. So um, the, the experiences as a, as a young child and as a teenager were those of um, having uh, uh, a, uh, like a second home in the mountains that we would go on a, on a weekly basis. Did, uh, did, did the community as a whole have traditions? Were there, was there an annual, uh, Independence Day celebration or other types of kind of community traditions or family traditions that you have that were always things that you always did that up in Lincoln Hills? Yeah, well, with our family, uh, we did. I mean, we would always have a Memorial Day cookout. 
we would have a July 4th cookout and we would have a Labor Day cookout where we may have uh, anywhere from uh, uh, 20 to 30 people up at the cabin that had come up for the day and we would spend the day just uh, enjoying each other and having cookouts. Now, about uh, maybe a mile down the road was uh, Wink's Lodge and Wink's Tavern. And um, uh, that particular lodge and cabin were, uh, uh, that particular lodge and tavern were, were open uh, basically from about 1928 to 1965. And during that period of time, there were travelers that uh, would come from across the United States uh, to spend time at, uh, at the tavern, at the lodge, Wink's Lodge. And during its heyday, there, there may have been eight or 10 other cabins that were connected to the lodge. So that um, I later learned that sometimes during the summer, there could be up to 5,000 black people that would be visiting Lincoln Hills, uh, going to Wink's Tavern, Wink's Lodge and those cabins. Because our cabin was uh, approximately, like I say, a mile away, we didn't really interact with those people that were coming up there to, to the lodge and the tavern because we, we had our own. So there was, there was no need to go over uh, to the lodge and to the tavern. And I can, I can say that uh, um, in 1965, which would have been um, when Wink's Lodge had uh, stopped functioning, I personally had never actually been to the lodge or to the tavern. I know that uh, uh, when I was a child, that uh, uh, sometimes my grandfather and maybe one of my uncles that was over 21, they would go over to the tavern uh, to get a drink and then come back to our to our cabin, uh, back to our cabin. But um, uh, that was a particular experience that I didn't have. Now my mother um, uh, was one of the uh, had the had the opportunity to actually go to Camp Nazoni. Camp Nazoni was the Black YWCA camp, and uh, my mother has in a personal diary um, um, written notes of her visiting Camp Nazoni. Uh, when she was 13 years of age for a week period of time and uh, enjoying that experience uh, um, uh, and um, having an opportunity to meet other black girls uh, from across the country that were up there for the week period of time that she was there. But my mother also says the same thing because we had our own cabin she personally never went over to Wink's Lodge or Wink's Tavern during its heyday. And so, uh, uh, and, and, and when I think back about it, it's, it's basically because our destination was to go to our cabin, Zephyr View Cabin. And once we reached that destination, you know, we were happy and satisfied. Thank you. Um, so you said your your grandfather built the cabin in 1922. Is that correct? Yeah, it was my great grandfather, uh, and that was William Pitts. William Pitts. Uh, right now, where our cabin is located, it's located at 31 Pitts Place. That road is named after my great grandfather. My great grandfather had first come to Colorado in 1919. He uh, was the son of an enslaved woman. Uh, he did learn how to read and write. He did learn the uh, trade of being a carpenter. And uh, in Missouri, uh, what he did for a living was to build homes and to build 
churches. Mm -hmm. But he came to Colorado in 1919 because he had a son that uh, had been injured in World War I and was in the VA hospital. So he had come to visit his son in the, uh, in the hospital. And uh, once uh, he arrived in Colorado, he discovered that uh, there were more opportunities for a black man in Colorado than there were in the uh, segregated South. So um, uh, he encouraged uh, his daughter, my grandmother, Elizabeth Pitts, and her husband to um, move from uh, um, Missouri uh, to Colorado. Um, he, in terms of enticing them to come to Colorado, he built uh, two homes on Garfield Street and he built a third home on Harrison Street. And of course, he also built the cabin up in Lincoln Hills. And this was the enticement to get them to moved to uh, Colorado. And so um, my um, grandfather, grandmother, it would have been at that time, my mother, who would have been about three years old, my uncle, who would have been six years old, they moved to Colorado in 1926. And so that began uh, uh, the history of the Scott family uh, living on uh, uh, Garfield Street and uh, and also having uh, the the cabin up in Lincoln Hills. Are those houses that cabin? Yes. I was just gonna. I was just curious to see if those houses that your great grandfather built on Garfield and Harrison are still standing. They are not. Um, there is one house still standing, and that was the. Uh, third house that he built on at 563 Harrison Street. That's a, um, a brick um, bungalow type of uh, house uh, with a, a nice front porch. Uh, that house is still standing, but the houses that he built on Garfield Street, uh, um, after my grandparents' death, they were, uh, they were sold. And, um, and so, uh, uh, what what used to be uh, small brick bungalows are now um, um, million dollar townhouses that are now on uh, that block. So you were you I, I you were uh, going to tell me about um, about the cabin, I think. Okay, uh, repeat your question because uh, you you broke up. I think you. I think when I started to ask my last question, you were going to start telling me about the cabin. Okay. Um, the cabin uh, back uh, last year, I, I, I believe that the day was actually November seventeenth, has been designated as an historic cabin by Gilpin County and their historic commission. So uh, we are, we're very proud uh, of that designation. Um, currently, uh, there's, there's uh, the uh, Winks Lodge has been designated as an historic building um, uh, and has a national designation. And uh, right now the YWCA uh, administration building has been designated by uh, Gilpin County as an historic building. So we are one of the, our cabin is one of the three buildings that has an historic designation uh, that has just uh, recently taken place. What kind of, uh, what kind of changes have, uh, the, 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 is the cabin still in your family? Rachel, your that question broke up. So I'm going to ask you to repeat the question. Certainly. Um, is the cabin still in your family? And then my second oh. question is, what kind of changes have taken place to the cabin itself over the years? Okay. Uh, the cabin is still in the family name. In fact, um, 
uh, the cabin yeah, has been yeah, uh, yeah. willed to myself and to a, a cousin. Uh, and so we are the owners of the cabin. My cousin, uh, Nancilia Regina uh, Belton, uh, is the owner of the cabin uh, with me. Now, over a period of time, uh, as we talked about, the cabin was first built in 1926. That's when it was occupied. Uh, the cabin has gone through um, several different, um, um, let's, let's just call them expansions. Um, back in the, uh, uh, and I would say it would, would have been in the early, late 40s, my, grand, my great grandfather built a, uh, a south bedroom onto the cabin. And then um, uh, later on, there was a deck, a west deck that was um, built onto the cabin. And so the cabin has expanded in size uh, on two different occasions over the years. And, um, and so uh, currently uh, what we are uh, attempting to do is to add two additional bedrooms onto the cabin so that uh, um, you know the ownership that we've had for 95 plus years we're hoping that with adding on a couple of additional bedrooms and um, upgrading the foundation of the cabin we'll be able to keep the cabin in our family uh, name for an additional 100 years so that's that's the that's the plans for the future that's amazing. So what what made you decide to try to get um, try to get the cabin onto the registry? Why was that important to you? Well, uh, from our perspective, it was important because of what was taking place uh, or what has taken place historically over the over the time. Uh, Lincoln Hills, uh, as you know, uh, was the only black owned recreational area for black people west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I've just recently learned was that uh, in California, there was a recreational area called Manhattan Beach. Uh, and that was in existence for only two or three years. And that was from about 1910 until 1912. Uh, at that time, Manhattan Beach, which was owned by uh, several black families, the property was basically condemned by the city and, uh, and made into a, a park type area. And so with the condemnation of Manhattan Beach, in reality, uh, after 1912, um, Lincoln Hills was the only black owned recreational area west of the Mississippi. And so during this period of time of uh, Jim Crow policies, uh, segregation, discrimination, um, black people could not recreate, uh, let's say in places like the Broadmoor and Colorado Springs, could not recreate in places like uh, Glenwood Springs uh, or uh, Estes Park. So uh, what was important historically to uh, black people and black families was uh, the importance of having uh, a place like Lincoln Hills where black people from all across the country could come to a place and feel like it was a safe ha haven I uh, feel like it was a place that uh, they could enjoy the mountains in a safe and secure environment. So what was important to our family was that we are one of the very few Black families that have maintained ownership of our property since the beginning, since 1926. And that uh, because of the significance of that ownership, because of the significance of our, our great grandfather being able to build that cabin by hand, 
using the resources that were available to him, it was important historically that our cabin be designated as an historic building so that future generations uh, will know about uh, the accomplishments of my great grandfather and our family being able to maintain uh, the history for uh, right now, 90 plus years. Your great grandfather built the three houses in Denver. He built the cabin. Was he, uh, did he work as a builder here in Denver? Well, he did. Um, 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 you know, during that period of time, and uh, he would have died um, sometime in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. But um, um, his work would have been work, working as a carpenter, mm -hmm. both in uh, the Denver and the Missouri area. So he mm -hmm. was going back and forth between uh, Colorado and Missouri mm -hmm. and, um, and basically plying his trade as a carpenter. Where, where in Missouri did he, did he move for, did he, uh, where did, in Missouri did he move from and was that the location he would go back to when he would travel? You know, um, um, Lincoln University, and I, let me just Google that just for a moment. Let's take a break for a moment sure. so I can get you the, uh, uh, the name of the town. Okay, hey. Lincoln University was in Jefferson City, oh, Missouri. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, um, he would have lived in Jefferson City. Um, as it turned out, uh, my grandmother uh, went to Lincoln University and would have graduated from Lincoln University in 1970. So, wow. um, so that would have been uh, uh, the town where uh, my great grandfather had uh, had had lived in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Great. So your um, your uh, great grandfather who built the cabin was that your your mother's grandfather or your father's grandfather? That would have been my mother's grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so that would have been my mother's grandfather. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, try, like keeping the conversation on Lincoln Hills um, so that we kind of have all the Lincoln Hills materials together. Um, do you have, um, as you got older, you, you, mo you said you mostly were at Lincoln Hills 
a lot of time while you were growing up, your childhood and your, your youth. Um, mm-hmm. Your family continue to go there after the 60s? Did, did that change as things kind of shifted in the 60s? Well, um, let me just say that in my college days, um, uh, Lincoln Hills became once again um, a vacation spot, uh, a, a place where uh, during college and law school, I, um, as a student, we'd have gatherings up there. Oh. Um, I, I can remember uh, during law school that uh, um, there would be times uh, that I would go to Lincoln Hills and uh, uh, we would, uh, uh, I would study, I would study uh, uh, my uh, uh, legal studies up at uh, Lincoln Hills. Um, Early on uh, in the seventies, when we formed the uh, Sam Carey Bar Association, we would have retreats where the members of uh, Sam Carey would come up to Lincoln Hills to our cabin to have barbecues and uh, retreats at the cabin. Uh, So uh, that social gathering, uh, a a place uh, that we could go to and feel comfortable um, continued. Um, uh, Along the same vein, uh, in 2008, when um, President Obama was nominated for president, uh, the Democratic nominee for president uh, uh, here in Colorado, uh, we had a gathering at our cabin where delegates uh, from across the country, um, uh, we, we met and had a uh, barbecue gathering uh, at, uh, at our cabin. So, um, Uh, What for me was uh, just an extension of um, of, uh, the the history and the importance of Lincoln Hills uh, continued on uh, through my uh, college, law school, and uh, days that uh, I was a young lawyer and we were forming the Sam Carey Bar Association up until as I indicated, 2008, being able to have Lincoln Hills uh, visited by um, delegates from across the country that were not aware of the uh, existence of Lincoln Hills. So those were those were important moments for us. Yeah, absolutely. And do you uh, do you go up there now with your children and with your grandchildren? Do they? You do? Do you have you continued on the family, the multi generational family trips up to Lincoln Hills? We do, we do, and um, we typically have uh, an annual gathering. It's usually July Fourth, and we call it uh, the gathering of the cousins. Um, my mother had uh, seven brothers and sisters, and as a result of uh, the seven brothers and sisters. There are lots of cousins, and um, uh, typically on on July fourth, or at least sometime during the summer, we'll have a gathering of, of all the cousins, where we may have forty to fifty people at the cabin. And so, uh, you know, the cabin, although it's it's small in in size in terms of square footage, it's about two thirds of an acre. We have the, uh, the wonderful outside uh, western deck. We have uh, on the east side uh, a, a big barreled uh, barbecue pit. And, um, and so uh, uh, the days are, are spent uh, uh, cooking and, and, and just enjoying uh, uh, being at the cabin site. That's wonderful. Are there, uh, are there anything else that I haven't asked you about Lincoln Hills that you want to share? Well, let me, uh, let me just say that, um, and, and this, this comes from an historic uh, perspective, uh-huh. um, yeah. the, developers, the developers of Lincoln Hills, uh, uh, when they incorporated, 
they called it the Lincoln Hills Country Club Development. That was the name of the, of the corporation. Back in about 2012, Robert Smith, who is a uh, multi-billionaire um, um, uh, investment uh, banker, uh, has had the occasion to purchase um, property in Lincoln Hills. And so, uh, uh, you know, he is one of the wealthiest black men uh, in the world. And, and what he has done is he has built a mountain home in Lincoln Hills. So he's got a mountain home in Lincoln Hills. Um, and he has been uh, very involved in, uh, in, and was the purchaser of Wink's Lodge back in 2012 from the James Beckworth Mountain Club that, that I was one of the board members of. And so by his acquisition of, uh, of, of the properties up in Lincoln Hills, Lincoln Hills has really gone full circle. It's gone from, uh, as described back in 1922 in the uh, incorporation documents, the Lincoln Hills Country Club development to uh, the, one of the wealthiest black men in the country now having acquired property for his family to build a mountain home and to help restore um, both Wink's Lodge and the uh, uh, other historic buildings that are now standing in Lincoln Hills. So to me, what's, what is significance is uh, having gone almost full circle from what uh, Lincoln Hill started off as to where it is right now. So do you see Lincoln Hills as, is it, is it getting ready to start growing again, do you think? Or is it just going to kind of at least preserve what's there? You know, I think that it's a mixture of both. There is growth in terms of there now being uh, persons that have, that have purchased property in that area where they may have $500,000 mountain homes to uh, those individuals that uh, still have mountain cabins in the area to um, um, there being uh, Robert Smith and his business partners that have put together a private fly fishing operation that uh, is characterized by ESPN, ESPN Magazine as one of the best fly fishing uh, uh, rivers uh, in Colorado. So uh, I look at it as sort of a mixed usage of mm -hmm. the old and the new and uh, and um, uh, some of the old is uh, the preservation of a, of a cabin such as ours to the new, there being um, um, uh, million dollar homes that are being built in that area. Is, the, is it, uh, is, are, the, are the cabins and the properties in Lincoln Hills uh, still primarily black owned or is it, less black than it used to be? Is there gentrification going on with this, with these expensive cabins coming in? Well, once again, it, it's, it's a mixture because I would have to say that Robert Smith now owns the majority of the property in Lincoln Hills. So that would be under, uh, of course, black ownership. However, there are other lots that, uh, uh, that are owned uh, uh, by white individuals. And I'd have to say that uh, if we were to look at the ownership from an historical point of view, there's probably only four or five families that have black, black families that have owned their property since the 1920s that mm -hmm. still own property up there. So that, that would be four or five. Um, what would have taken place is um, many of the, of the families that were involved in the initial ownership of 
of property in Lincoln Hills because of uh, the depression, uh, the Great Depression, uh, and because of uh, uh, other uh, economic reasons, um, uh, we're not able to maintain the property. Hmm. So, I uh, I guess I, I don't I don't want to step away from Lincoln Hills completely until I'm sure that we're done done talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about the past. We talked about your experiences, where it's where you are thinking about it's going into the future. Um, I always I always like to think about people who are going to come and want to listen to your oral history and learn more about Lincoln Hills. Um, and is there something that we we haven't heard yet? That that we might want to share with um, a young scholar or a young a young person who's interested in learning about Lincoln Hills and what Lincoln Hills meant to the people who lived there. Um, what should they know about that? You know, I think that um, you know what is important is. Um, a couple of different things. One would be why in Gilpin County was the environment so welcoming to black people, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second of all, what is important is, um, is that Lincoln Hills during its uh, early growth to um, the time that it, it, it basically uh, changed from black ownership, which would have been in about um, the 60s. And, and I'm, I'm talking about Wink's Lodge, Wink's mm -hmm. Tavern. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, Winks Hamlet died, he would have died mm -hmm. in 1965. Mm -hmm. That uh, there, there remained uh, 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 vibrant, despite the fact that in other places in Colorado, there was KKK involvement in government systems. Mm -hmm. And that... Uh, uh, Lincoln Hills remained uh, a place that was available to black people. It remained a, uh, a safe environment for black people and that uh, it did not uh, it did not um, succumb if I can use that word, to uh, uh, those people that may have been uh, hostile to um, uh, its existence. So it, uh, it was a place that was in the Green Book uh, that people would travel to, whether they came by train or by car, and that uh, this was a place that survived through uh, some difficult times in uh, U.S. history. And to me, uh, for, from the perspective of a, of a young scholar, it is what, uh, what caused that survival. It uh, not only was uh, the ingenuity and the industrial, and, and, and the industrial um, nature of, of certain black people, but it was also uh, the uh, welcoming um, attitude of those people that lived in Gilpin County. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to look at it from uh, a couple of different perspectives. It was a, um, it was a Mecca uh, uh, and it was a unique place uh, for 
for Colorado to have, where if you looked um, 15 miles to the north, uh, the environment was not as welcoming. And I'm talking about Estes Park. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at um, uh, 60 miles to the west, um, and maybe 90 miles to the west, Glenwood Springs, mm -hmm. it was not as welcoming. But so there was this, uh, there was this particular, uh, as I put it, Mecca that uh, 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 black people such as my great grandmother and grandparents and other families were able to thrive. So that's that's the that's the uh, that's uh, that's a part of the uh, of uh, what I consider to be the interesting history of uh, Lincoln Hills. Wonderful. So Lincoln Hills, that's thank you so much for sharing that. That's really wonderful. I love hearing your memories about that. Um, do we want to move over? I'd love to hear, um, I definitely want to hear lots of, of, of your stories about, about your, your legal career. Um, I, but, but maybe could we back up a little bit to your education before you went off to college and just talk, sharing sure. uh, things about your education and your parents, uh, your parents' approach to that and your grandparents' approach to that. And... Sure, sure. Um, let me just say that um, starting with my great grandfather um, who learned to read and write and uh, which was uh, very unique for a person to have been uh, the product of an enslaved mother and a slave master that he learned to read and write. And the fact that um, his uh, oldest daughter uh, was able to go to college, Lincoln University, uh, an historic black college uh, in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, and, and get a degree in 1917 was very, very significant. And um, uh, what to me was was interesting um, was we were able to save some of her college books that we've maintained at the cabin. And so there was a college book on sociology. There was a college book on economics. There was a college book on how women uh, could um, become employable. That was, that was the a, a name of a book. So these were books that she was studying back in um, um, the uh, period of time that she was in, in college. So uh, she would have got that degree in 1970. But um, as a result of, um, of, uh, of her college education, uh, all of my aunts and uncles um, went to college uh, and obtained, uh, at, least, at least all of them went to college, uh, except for one who uh, entered into the military. Mm -hmm. So college was, um, um, uh, was sort of an expectation for our family. And for me, uh, uh, while growing up, it was always, um, uh, uh, not an option. I mean, college was, was something that my brother and I and sister uh, were going to uh, attempt. And I know my mother's proud that, uh, you know, I have a Juris Doctorate. My sister has a PhD from Johns Hopkins. And my brother has a uh, doctorate in, uh, as an EDD from uh, the University of, of Northern Colorado. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, uh, education has always been very important in, 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 in uh, our family. Um, my dad, uh, who uh, uh, 
uh, came from Missouri also, and he came from a little town called Mexico, had gone to segregated schools in, in high school and, uh, and prior to high school. Uh, he ended up entering into the military uh, during World War II. He um, became a master sergeant. He worked in a, in a black uh, army division. He um, uh, obtained three bronze stars while in the army. His, his last uh, um, uh, army placement uh, after World War II was in Laramie, Wyoming. Mm. And so uh, that he would have met my mother in coming down to USO events uh, here, in, here in, in Denver. And that's how he met my mother. And so uh, my father, uh, utilizing the army benefits, went to... Uh, an, an art technical school and became a technical illustrator. And so uh, uh, he too uh, knew the value of, of, of education and uh, got his uh, uh, technical degree um, after the military. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I use that as sort of a premise as to how um, my brother and I and sister were, were raised by our parents. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a period of time between the ages of five and 10 that my parents lived in the uh, Five Points area. Mm -hmm. They lived uh, in a neighborhood on 27th and Ray Street. Mm -hmm. My parents always felt that the schools over... Uh, uh, in the North Cherry Creek area were better schools based upon resources, based upon uh, the teachers, based upon even the, the building structures themselves. So for a five year period of time from the from kindergarten till about fourth or fifth grade, my parents every single day drove us from our home on 27th and Ray Street over to uh, my grandparents' parents house on 3rd and Garville so that we could attend uh, Steck Elementary School. And so um, that was a part of their feelings regarding um, uh, their, their belief that the black schools in the black neighborhoods did not have the same resources as the white schools had. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, that was important to them that uh, my brother and I get the, the best education that was available to us. So what are uh, your... Rachel, let's, 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 let's take about a two minute break. I'm going to go to the restroom and I'm going to get a drink of water. Sounds good. I'm going to put it on pause and I'll, I'll unpause it when we come back. Back. Okay. All right, so would you start off by um, uh, coming back here, um, talking about going to, uh, going to the elementary school. Um, were you one of the few black kids in the school and how, how, what was that like? Well, um, you know, in probably um, elementary school, and this is at Steck. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot remember there ever being another black child in a class with me. Uh, I would say that um, um, there were probably uh, during my elementary years um, that there were not more than three or four black families that lived in the North Cherry Creek area, mm -hmm. whose kids were going to school at the same time that I was going to school. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say, what it, was it like? Um, uh, there was not what I would call any type of overt racism that um, I can remember ever suffering from from kids or family members, um, um, 
during my elementary school years. Um, however, uh, when I say however, I had a friend who um, I've known ever since kindergarten, who later in life told me that uh, uh, he can remember having sleepovers at my house, but that his parents would not allow me to sleep over at his house. And that that uh, was a uh, concern that he had uh, in, in growing up that uh, uh, he never presented that to me uh, until, uh, and, and we've now been friends um, 70 years. And it wasn't until later in life that we even talked about that kind of stuff. And, you know, as, as children, um, uh, it, it was not something that, that, that um, I thought about. Um, um, did, did you like during school? Those, I'm sorry? I was going to ask if you liked school as as in elementary. Were you were you a student right away? Yeah, I I liked school. I was a good student. Um, I was a competitive student. Um, uh, there were kids that uh, I would compete with, and you know who could uh, uh, be the, the the best uh, uh, in terms of uh, math classes. So I was a I was a I was a good student. Um, also, um, my brother and I were good athletes. Um, we were only a year apart, so uh, we uh, were involved in uh, athletics, uh, young American League football and baseball, and so uh, we 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 did well both in sports and in school. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was a I was an A student. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, um, so I did enjoy school and, uh, and I, I, I excelled, uh, uh, while I was in school. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, as you got older and, and this goes into, uh, junior high school days, that's when, um, uh, social things, uh, that 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 you know that uh, socially that there are what I call separation. Um, uh, there would have uh, um, there were not let's say the the dances or the uh, private parties. Uh, um, those types of um, uh, those types of social uh, experiences didn't take place um, um, very frequently uh, for me, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know it's um, um, but um, you know I don't know how to how to describe that because. Um, the the my best friends ended up being the other black family that lived in the same neighborhood that we lived in. They were the Kaysen family, and so uh, the the social things that uh, I would do would have been involved with them. Um, and visiting their home and the, they visiting my home. But, um, you know, there was, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, any type of overt um, racism, the only, the only thing that marks my, my memory is a, a police abuse situation that happened with my father when, um, I was about seven years old. My brother was six years old. Um, my father was uh, involved in a uh, minor traffic uh, incident on Fifth and Garfield Street where the police officer aggressively pulled him out of the car, pushed him up against the hood of the 
car and basically inquired why was he in the neighborhood uh, as if he did not belong in the neighborhood. Um, and so that was a, a police incident that um, I vividly remember and uh, was uh, the probably the most um, um, overt act of, uh, of racism that, uh, that, that I particularly dealt with as, as, as a young person. So then if you, um, if you were uh, excluded from a lot of social events in, in high school, um, did, did you have us uh, that from, from church? I wouldn't, or, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say excluded. I would say um, uninvited because um, um, if there were, let's say, social parties that were going on uh, during the high school years, uh, I was just not invited to those. So it ended up that I would attend social events at Manual High School, East High School, Cathedral High School. And so uh, it was sort of the, uh, uh, an unspoken type of separation, if I can use that term. So, so what high school did you attend then? George Washington. Okay. So George Washington High School. So at, at that time, George Washington High School was considered to be the premier high school uh, in Denver. Uh, the best teachers uh, came from East High School and, uh, and South High School and were teaching at uh, George Washington. Um, and so uh, uh, I was the first class that uh, graduated uh, uh, from George Washington that went through all three years. Wow. So, the, so then um, again, it sounds like your parents were really setting you up to be academically successful and to be able to get that level of education that you would need to be able to go out and do whatever you wanted to do. Um, did you live yeah. close to George Washington or did you have to bus or drive or? Well, um, we would, uh, um, George Washington was the, was the neighborhood school. George Washington was probably two miles from um, where we lived. Um, I uh, uh, carpooled with, with other students uh, to, uh, to go to, to get to George Washington. Um, um, by the time I was a junior, I purchased my own car. So I was able to drive uh, to and from George Washington my junior and senior years. But um, um, uh, uh, but it was, a, it was a situation where uh, um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm trying to remember back to my first year at George Washington, which would have been my sophomore year. Uh, I guess I must have taken the bus to get to George Washington. I can't even remember. I can't remember <laughs> how, how I would have got there other than uh, maybe carpooling with other uh, students in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you said you bought a car your junior year. Um, what were your first jobs that you had? Mm -hmm. You know, I um, my very first job was I was a um, sacker at uh, Safeway. Mm -hmm. And Safeway was uh, located in the neighborhood. Um, and I would... Uh, um, worked there during the, the summer months uh, as a sacker. And uh, what was unique was uh, at that time, I was the only black employee at, at the Safeway uh, 
that that I worked that mm -hmm. I worked at. But it was uh, it was a um, you know it was a it was a, a good job for uh, a ninth tenth grader, and uh, it was something that I did for a couple of years uh, during the summer months. So, um, so at George Washington, um, you said that you were involved in athletics with baseball and football, and you were involved, uh, and you were an A student. Um, what, at that age, what, where did you start figuring out that you wanted, um, I believe one of your interviews, you said you actually were going to start with engineering. Um, when did you start kind of figuring out that that was the first place you wanted to go? Well, I I think it was it was because uh, at that period of time, um, politically, there was what was called the Cold War going on mm -hmm. between Russia and the United States. Mm -hmm. Khrushchev was the prime minister, and um, and um, and because I was I was good academically in sciences and math um i um i decided that uh that's what i wanted to be was an engineer and so um uh when i went when when my thoughts were in terms of attending college uh, uh my thought was that i wanted to be an engineer and that was uh, just based upon um uh, being good in, in math and science. Mm -hmm. So then how did you pick the University of Redfield? It was actually University of Red Lums. Oh, I'm sorry. So R-E-D-L-A-N-D-S. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. You know, uh, um, the University of Red Lums was um, actually a, a place that I was directed to by my um, college counselor, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take another break because my grandchildren have just come home, okay. and I'm going to take the computer into another room. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we can have some privacy. Okay? okay. I'll pause it until we come back. Okay, how is this? Oh, sounds good. Okay, let me set myself up. Yeah. And let me tell you, Rachel, this is harder than I thought it would be. How so? Uh, just trying to think back and, uh, and uh, I, I hope that what we're talking about is, is even interesting. It very much is. Um, it very much is interesting, and I really appreciate you taking the time. That's why. That's why I said that if we, you know, if we wanted to roll over into a second session, we could because it definitely takes a lot of, you know, you're going back multiple years in many of these, in many of for many of these stories, and and um, you know, the, these sorts of things just take some time to think about. Okay. Yeah. Well, if if we're if if. Uh... If this is interesting, we can continue. But, okay. but uh, we were talking. We were talking about Redlands. Yes. Um, growing up, because of uh, the neighboring black family, mm -hmm. um, she was a very, very. Uh, she was a very, very good student. Mm -hmm. uh, she was two years older than me. She would have been. When I was a sophomore at uh, George Washington, mm -hmm. she would have been a senior mm -hmm. and she got a scholarship to Stanford. So mm -hmm. she went to Stanford. And um, so as I, and because, because I sort of marveled at how smart she was, I thought I wanted to go to Stanford also. Mm -hmm. My college counselor, said I was in Stanford material. And he directed me to a small 
college in California called the University of Redlands. Mm -hmm. He thought that Redlands was, uh, that I was a, um, uh, that Redlands was more appropriate for me. Uh, and so I never even applied for Stanford. Mm. The only college that I applied for um, was University of Redlands. Mm -hmm. And um, what ended up happening is I got a scholarship, academic scholarship to go to Redlands, that, which mm -hmm. paid my uh, tuition. I received what was called a Sachs scholarship from Colorado Springs that uh, gave me an additional $500 a year. Mm -hmm. And the basketball coach at Redlands sent me a letter saying that he wanted me to uh, try out for the basketball team. Mm -hmm. At that point in my life, I'm, I'm 17 years of age. Uh, basketball was, was very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. I had aspirations of, uh, of, of being a pro basketball player. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I had not, although I had uh, played in high school, I had not excelled in high school mm -hmm. as, as a, as a uh, basketball player. Mm -hmm. So for me, this was an opportunity to uh, prove myself as a basketball player. And um, I, I uh, um, decided to attend University of Redlands mm -hmm. and went out to University of Redlands sight unseen and um, got there. And um, it turned out to be a um, small college of about 1500 students, wow. which was uh, smaller than the high school that I had attended in terms of, of the number of students. Um, and, um, and so uh, I ended up only staying at Redlands for one year mm -hmm. because of the 1500 students, there were only a total of three black students at Redlands. And so I did not want to go through the same experience that I had had at uh, George Washington of being one of uh, a one of a handful of black students. Right. So um, I uh, made the decision to uh, to transfer to CU Boulder mm -hmm. um, after after one year. So then was it was it before Boulder or was it at Boulder that you decided to change trajectories and go toward law? Okay. Well, you know, this, this is really um, a part of that story because when I went away to Redlands, 1963, mm. that was a tumultuous year. Uh, 1963, uh, there was the death of Medgar Edwards. He was mm -hmm. assassinated. In August of 63, that would have been uh, the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. In September of 63 was the Birmingham uh, bombing. And then in November of 63, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. So when I look back at those four events and then my transferring to CU in September of 64, when I met my very first black attorney, uh, that is what uh, propelled me to change my major from being engineer to an attorney. Because the first black attorney I met, uh, his, um, uh, the attorney's son was Sonny Flowers, who was the very first black person I met on campus in, at CU when I arrived in September of 64. Uh, I met Sonny, uh, we became uh, fast friends. Um, his mother lived in Boulder. His mother was a lawyer, uh, had, a, had a law degree as well as a PhD in, in Romance languages. And then his father, um, mother and father were divorced I met his father at a parents' weekend 
early in the fall of 63. And he was a civil rights lawyer in Arkansas. And meeting him and learning about uh, the kind of work he was doing in Arkansas. Uh, uh, and, and he was very, very charismatic. Uh, he owned his own law firm in, um, in Arkansas. And learning about the, the type of what I consider to be positive work that he was doing in Arkansas, uh, meeting Mr. and Mrs. Flowers, the first two uh, attorneys I had ever met uh, caused me to, uh, to change my major from engineering to political science. Mm -hmm. And so that put me on the pathway of, uh, of going to law school. That's amazing. I um, so uh, at CU Boulder, what was the um, you specifically switched to CU Boulder because you were one of three black students on campus uh, at the University of Europe. What did that change for you at Boulder? Was was there a um, a well, larger uh, community in Boulder? Be, uh, Thirty black students is a lot more than three black students right. so although there were only about 30 black students um like i say that's a that's a lot more than three yeah and it's a lot more black students that i had ever been around in my whole educational career and so um uh the black students at uh, cu boulder uh we were close-knit even though of those 30 black students, probably 20 of them were athletes, mm -hmm. um, we had a we had a close knit uh, community, uh, and and so it was a different social and uh, uh, and and educational experience than I had ever been before. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turned out, uh, Sunny Flowers and I became roommates uh, after, uh, after my first year at Boulder, uh, along with another black student, Chuck Williams, who was, a, was there on a athletic scholarship. And so uh, the three of us uh, became fast friends and uh, maintained that friendship for over 50 years. Um, but, uh, when you look back at it, uh, sort of from afar, CU Boulder was not a whole lot different than um, uh, than George Washington High School, but it, uh, uh, but like I say, 30s more than three, or 30s more than five, and so uh, it, uh, it 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 was a significant difference to uh, um, sort of change the trajectory of, of what I was, what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Being, um, being a, a college student in the 60s, um, I, as well as a political science major, were you politically active? Were, did you get involved in civil rights movements on campus? Not until 1968. 1968 was a, a turning point for me. 1968, as, as I know you're going to remember from your history background, um, uh, that would have been the uh, spring of my first year in law, in law school, the spring semester. And during that spring semester, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to Oakland, California that summer. And Sonny Flowers had the opportunity of going to New York that summer. Both of us went to the different coasts for purposes of employment. Mm -hmm. But uh, that experience in Oakland, Berkeley, in 1968 was an awakening for me. And it was the type of awakening that uh, there was the, the uh, 
sort of the birth of the Black Panthers. Um, my uncle, who I live with in uh, Oakland, was uh, only seven years older than I. He was uh, working on getting his college degree. And so I was attending campus activities at the University of California at Hayward. I was going to Berkeley. I was going to uh, <clears throat> events at uh, the parks in Oakland where there would be Black Panther celebrations. There would be uh, Black Muslim uh, celebration and events. There were other Black nationalism events going on. And then of course, there was also uh, the Students for Democratic Society uh, rallies that were taking place at Berkeley. And all of that was an awakening for me in terms of uh, what I felt was important as my role as a black person, as a black man. I did a ton of reading uh, that summer, uh, James Baldwin, uh, Malcolm X, uh, um, all the black literature that uh, I could uh, read during the summer. And uh, that uh, Oakland experience uh, changed my frame of mind uh, in terms of who I was as a, as a black man. And so uh, a part of that was uh, 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 symbolic. Uh, when I came back to Boulder in, uh, it would have been the September of 1968, I had an Afro out to here. So, uh, uh, and, and I was uh, uh, um, a different person in terms of my perspective, in terms of what I needed to do in terms of uh, my law school experience. And so uh, one of the other things that happened in September of 68 is in my law school class of 63, I mean of, of 1967, there were a total of three black students out of 150 students in my first year class. There was one other black upper class person um, so there were four of us out of 450 uh, at the law school uh, in, uh, in, 19, in 1967, my first year. That September of 68, three black students came in in the first year class. And so the, the population of black students basically doubled the next year. And those three uh, black students were uh, um, um, were actually all older than me. They had all had military experience and one was uh, Phil Tate the second who was probably 20 years older than me, had been in the military for 20 some years. And um, uh, uh, became almost like a big brother uh, to me. Uh, and uh, we, as a group, the Tate brothers, uh, Sunny Flower and myself, and there was an assistant dean at uh, the CU Law School who uh, concentrated on how we were going to increase uh, not only the number of diverse students at the law school, but the number of diverse uh, students throughout the undergrad of CU Boulder. And so that second year in law school was not only a second year of me uh, taking coursework, uh, the regular 
core coursework uh, to graduate from law school, but becoming actively involved in a diversity effort uh, for CU Law School and undergrad, where we were uh, traveling the state, encouraging uh, more diverse students to come to the law school, uh, as well as putting on uh, what I would call sensitivity programs with uh, uh, corporations and uh, uh, educational uh, groups um, talking about uh, um, um, basically the inequality of, of Black people uh, in the United States. So that, that started uh, my second year of law school. So how did that, um, to the extent you're willing to share, how did that, um, that, that summer or that, that year of 1968, how did that shift kind of your ideas of where you wanted to go with a law career in your first year of school versus what you ended up changing in your second year of school? Well, still, still the um, the goal was to get a law degree, mm -hmm. yeah. so that was the goal. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, at that point, I had not really thought about what I was going to do with a law degree, other than um, um, my my initial initial thought was that I wanted to be a public defender. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to graduate from law school, get hired by the public defender's office, be able to represent people who I thought were uh, not being, not being uh, uh, treated fairly and not mm -hmm. uh, having uh, the resources of a, of a good lawyer to represent them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hope I, I've answered the question. Yeah. But yeah. It, it was, uh, um, but it, you know, it was it was a it was a step by step progression because um, I had the good fortune that I was able to get an internship um, the summer of after after my second year. After my, you know, after my second year of law school, I had a, a, a law clerk position with what's called a 17th Street law firm. So um, um, it was a medium sized law firm. At the time, there were only uh, two black faces on 17th Street. One was Marilyn Kaysen my neighborhood friend who had gone away to Stanford ended up going to the University of Michigan getting a law degree. And so she was the very first black lawyer on 17th Street. She would have been hired in 68. Mm -hmm. I was uh, hired in 1969 to be a law clerk on 17th Street. So was she and I as the only two black faces on 17th Street. So that was a that was a summer job. It ended up being the type of summer job that uh, was important for my resume. Mm -hmm. um, although not really understanding and recognizing the importance of a resume at that time, <laughs> since I had not had any uh, lawyers in the family. Right. Um, and then uh, my third year of law school, I got a job as a legal intern for the Denver District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. And that also turned out to be a plum position because it was such an important position being an intern for the Denver DA's office that um, I was actually photographed and uh, and pictured in the Denver Post with uh, three of my colleagues that were sworn in to be legal interns. Mm -hmm. And so um, that also, that position 
also propelled me in terms of uh, uh, what was going to be my future as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And it also, in one way, uh, prevented me from being a public defender. <laughs> because when I, when I uh, applied to be a public defender, I was rejected because I had, had that one year of being a prosecutor. Um, I'd, I'd done that one year as legal intern because it was a way to, to pay my tuition. And I didn't, I didn't realize that it was going to have the type of negative effect that uh, would prevent me from being a public defender. Right. I, 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 find that, I find that really interesting because I think that that goes to what you said earlier about these are all new things to you because you hadn't had a lawyer in the family. And so you hadn't had someone who could say, don't do this because it'll prevent you from doing this. Um, I, I went through grad school the same way where I was learning as I went along to what uh -huh. you do. Because I mean, I knowing nothing about the, the legal profession would think, oh, that's a great idea. Because then you get experience with the other side, right? Like you would know the public, you would know what the district attorney does and that would make you a better public defender. Um, so it's really interesting to me that um, that, that was the case. Um, yeah. but, that, but that headed you down the path that you, you went along. Um, so, yeah. 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 You know, so, uh, as it ended up, when I could not get hired uh, as a public defender, uh, I uh, applied to be a Denver district attorney and got hired to be a, a deputy district attorney. And so, uh, uh, as it turned out, that was fortuitous because of the, the type of experience that, that you get. Uh, as a as a deputy district attorney, as a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And it was also unique because once again, uh, I was placed into a situation where I was the only black deputy district attorney in the state out of 400 or more uh, deputy district attorneys. I'm going to my notes from the, the um, one of the interviews you did where you talk about your your career because after that you um, you went to uh, you you maxed out your salary so you you went to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Correct, correct. And so I um, um, because of that prosecution experience in the Denver DA's office when I applied to be a U.S. Attorney, an assistant U.S. Attorney, I was hired. And as it turned out, I was the only black federal prosecutor in a five state area, uh, the tenth, what's called the 10th circuit. And so uh, once again, I'm uh, in a very, very unique place that, uh, uh, that I am the only black person in the room, mm -hmm. basically, basically. Right. Right. How does that shape your, the way you approach things? Is that, does it create a, a greater sense of responsibility? Does it create a, a feeling of, um, you know, the, the type of program you did at, at CU where you were trying to like teach people how to expand the number of people in these occupations and professions and, and you know, fight for, for like greater diversification of, of just, people in different types of positions. Is that, I, 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 cause I know I, 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 I watched your, or I looked at your slideshow from the, um, from the uh, American Board of Trial Advocates when they, they, they honored you with that award. And you talk about this, about being the only black face in the room. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with a term called the imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. Okay. I never had the imposter syndrome. I never felt like I wasn't capable of doing what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's because um, academically I, I had always been successful, mm -hmm. except for one, one course in law school, I'd always been successful. Um, I, um, 
believe that uh, I had great family support. Um, I had family members who were always in leadership positions. And um, uh, I grew up in an environment in Denver where I saw, uh, and I know it was isolated, but the black people that I knew were prominent black people, mm. whether they be my doctor, uh, Edmund Knoll, who was the very first black doctor to have hospital privileges at Rose, mm -hmm. or his brother, who was a dentist, or Rachel Knoll, mm -hmm. who was the head of the school board, mm -hmm. or the uh, few black police officers that I knew that were prominent. Um, So all I can say, Rachel, is that uh, um, I had no fear um, about being that only black person. And as it turned out, when I was hired as a deputy DA, I was assigned to the only black, or excuse me, the only woman judge in the county. And that was uh, Zeta Weinshank, who had graduated from Harvard. And so, you know, the only black uh, deputy district attorney was assigned to the only woman judge, which turned out to be fortuitous because she was brilliant. And, uh, and so uh, uh, today we would call that implicit bias or unconscious bias that assignment. Uh, but the reality is, is it was probably very conscious the decision that was made of assigning me to her courtroom. But um, I flourished in her courtroom. And um, by becoming a, a good and successful trial lawyer as a deputy DA, that allowed me to get the next position as an assistant US attorney where once again, I flourished, although I was the only black person in the room. But uh, there were most judges were, and most colleagues were very, very supportive of me. And, and uh, so that continued me on my trajectory. Thank you. Um, so after you were with the, um, after you were with the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, after you were a U.S. District Attorney, or excuse me, a U.S. Assistant Attorney, um, you went into private practice, and you were in private practice for a number of years. Um, uh, 37, as a, 37 as a, years. As, a, as an, uh, as one of the, um, owners of the firm, um, uh, how, what, what kind of law did you practice when you... Uh, we're in private practice. Well, I was a trial attorney, which mm -hmm. meant that um, I'm one of the very few attorneys that has prosecuted a first degree murder case, defended a first degree murder case, and handled a condemnation case where you're acquiring property to build Coors Field. So uh, I had that type of variety of experiences that I did as a as a trial attorney. So um, um, over the course of 37 years, I did trial work on commercial cases, personal injury cases, criminal cases, uh, um, and condemnation cases. So um, uh, I had a I had a wide um, variety of, of trial work that I did in 37 years. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to um, 
I, I, and I'm, I, I apologize, I'm going to use the terms probably wrong here and I'll ask you to correct me so that I'm not using them incorrectly, but to, to run for uh, the court. Okay. Um, in, in Colorado, you don't, you, you're not elected to be a judge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, in some states, Texas, Alabama, you run to be a judge. Okay. In Colorado, we have uh, a process where you're selected to be a judge mm -hmm. by either a governor mm. or a mayor. Okay. Um, and so, um, and so I was, uh, I decided in um, 2012, after 37 years in private practice to become a judge. And when I say that, I had, I had attempted to be a judge one time previously, uh -huh. which was back in 1993, uh -huh. when uh, there was an opening on the US federal court. Bill Clinton was the president and I had the opportunity to be the very first black federal court judge in Colorado's history. Uh -huh. It ended up that uh, uh, a colleague of mine, a, a very good friend of mine, who was also black, mm -hmm. he had more political mm -hmm. juice than I had, and he got selected. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it ended up that I didn't apply again to be a judge until 2012. Mm -hmm. And that was based upon, um, in reality, a medical reason. Mm -hmm. In 2012, I had prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I ended up going through surgery, uh -huh. had the prostate removed, uh -huh. but the surgery uh -huh. and the impact of the prostate cancer took away the energy level uh -huh. uh, that I needed to be successful in private practice. And I made a decision at 68 years of age, uh -huh. six, you know, six, 68 years of age to be judged. And that in reality is, uh, is late is very late in life for most judges but uh, i made the decision to apply to be a judge and i was selected mm -hmm. and so it was a combination of uh of, of, of a medical reason mm -hmm. and uh, the opportunity to to become a judge mm -hmm. and with that being um uh, denver county court was that a mayoral um selection then Yes. Okay. And so who yeah. is the mayor? So Denver the County Court, uh, Mayor Hancock. Okay. So Mayor Michael Hancock. Mm -hmm. And so that was a strategic decision because, uh, you know, throughout my career, uh, there were opportunities to be county court, district court, appellate court, mm -hmm. Supreme Court, federal mm -hmm. court. But I thought that uh, at this point in my life, I could have a greater impact uh, in terms of uh, of who I am and what I had to offer by being a county court judge, mm -hmm. where I would have a greater impact upon a greater number of people. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason why I decided to be a county court judge at age 68. That's amazing. I, I mean, um, you know, I, I would think many people would just say, I'm just going to go ahead and retire. Uh, and so I, I you, you continuing to say, you know, the law is so important to you that you want to continue with that. Um, just kind of, a, I have kind of a logistical question, uh, because Denver is both a city and a county. What kind of right. uh, cases are tried at the county level? Um, misdemeanor cases. And the misdemeanor cases are domestic violence, where there's not serious bodily injury, driving under the influence cases, uh, theft cases under $1,000 in value. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's misdemeanor type cases okay. or civil cases where the damages are under 25,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those, those are the types of cases that are tried at the county court level. Okay. 
Okay. And so it's at the county court level that most citizens have their contact with uh, the court system, yeah. whether it's a traffic case, whether it's a traffic case, whether mm -hmm. it's a careless driving case, mm -hmm. whether it's, uh, mm -hmm. like I say, some civil suit under $25,000 in damage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where most citizens will have a yeah. contact with the court system. And that's the reason why I decided to be a judge in that system. Right. So the the um, the the contact. I I understand just having the contact. Um, what is the reason behind? Like, you, what is your reason behind that? Like, why is why for you is it more interesting or compelling to be uh, to sit on a bench where you are uh, coming in contact with lots of people for smaller offenses than it would be to sit on the, the bench to judge um, people who are um, uh, committing felonies and, and then you'd be seeing fewer people? Well, why is that a, a compelling reason for you to choose that court? I think it really goes back to being a role model. Um, this would give me a bigger reach in terms of being a role model. It would give me a bigger reach in terms of other things that I do outside the courtroom that uh, <clears throat> allowed me to have the time uh, and energy to be able to do the other things that uh, are important for me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that we we didn't talk about yet, but I know is very important that I definitely want to hear about is the is the Sam Carey Association. Okay. Well, the Sam Carey Bar Association, first of all, was the very first affinity bar or minority bar in mm -hmm. the state. So mm -hmm. back in 1971, when we formed it, uh, there was not a woman's bar association. There was not the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. There was not the Hispanic American Bar Association. So we were the very first specialty bar. Mm -hmm. um, at the time in Colorado, there were only about 15 black lawyers in the state. So that's 15 out of about 5,000. And um, at the time, uh, when we formed the uh, Sam Carey Bar Association, I would call us a group of seven young Turks, <clears throat> seven people who um, felt that we had the power to be able to make a change within the legal system. And when I say make a change, at that time in 1971, there were no black law professors there uh, were only one black lawyer on 17th Street. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, and that was Marilyn Kaysen. Mm -hmm. There were <clears throat> um, the black lawyers were either in private practice or working for government agencies. So there were very few opportunities for us other than being government lawyers or having our own law firms. So we came together, created the Sam Carey Bar Association to effectuate change, changes. Mm -hmm. And um, as it turned out, the seven of us um, have made substantial contributions uh, uh, within the, the legal field. Uh, Norm Early, who was one of the founders, became our first black uh, district attorney. Raymond Dean Jones became our very first black court of appeals judge. Um, Dan Muse became our very first black city attorney under Wellington Webb. Um, Phil Jones, uh, um, he and Billy Lewis uh, formed a black uh, uh, 
private practice where they uh, employed about five lawyers. Uh, and, then, and then Phil Jones, when he left the private practice, became a State Department lawyer for about 30 years. Um, Billy Lewis, who's passed away, um, uh, was, was one of Colorado's uh, very good trial lawyers, known his own practice. King Trimble, um, had his own law firm before he passed away. And then the, the seventh person was Gloria Monroe. Mm. Uh, Gloria Monroe um, ended up uh, leaving Colorado and has been practicing um, 50 some years as an attorney in Wyoming. So, uh, I think that those are the seven people that were the uh, founders of the Sam Carey Bar Association. If I got my numbers right. <laughs> I mean, the accomplishments just of the sub, the sub of you that, that started it is um, overwhelming. I, um, would you like to share some of the accomplishments of the association itself? Um, because you you said you formed to um, to uh, you know to open those experiences. So so what are the, some of the things that the bar that the Sam Carey Bar Association does has, has done in the past or continues to do? Well, uh, um, you know I think that the most important thing it was the vanguard of all the affinity bars that came along afterwards, mm -hmm. and so that's where where I say the Women's Bar Association. Well if we do it in time. The Hispanic Bar came next in 1972. The Women's Bar came next in 1976. The Asian Pacific American Bar Association came next. Then came the LGBTQ Bar. And then came next the um, South Asian Bar Association. So uh, to me, those are, those are all now very, very important uh, specialty bars in Colorado. Um, you know, when you talk about the association itself, um, you know, the association is, has been active in terms of uh, encouraging law schools now to have women law professors, black law professors, Latino law professors. You know, I look at that as, as, as one of the uh, uh, accomplishments of uh, the Sam Carey Bar Association. Uh, another accomplishment is um, being uh, involved as a board in terms of uh, uh, lawyers of color and women lawyers now being members of 17th Street law firms, mm -hmm. you know, the major commercial mm -hmm. law firms. Um, I look at um, uh, you know, employment uh, as being uh, uh, one of the most important things that uh, that the Sam Carey Bar Association has been involved in. And then there's also what I call the um, um, networking or uh, um, homecoming that uh, specialty bars provide for its members. You know, it's a place to uh, 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 have a certain comfort level in terms of meeting and addressing issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. would, would you very briefly um, explain homecoming for anyone who's watching this that might not know what that is? Uh, each year we have an event. Mm 
which we call the homecoming. And that's where uh, we have a roll call where each member of Sam Carey will talk about where they graduated from law school, uh, where they're currently working, and uh, what, what is their specialty. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, a traditional event that people very much enjoy. And we start with the uh, person that is the youngest in terms of graduating from law school to the person such as me who always speaks last as to uh, uh, the last or the senior person who, who's a member of, of the Bar Association. So it's a, it's a traditional, uh, uh, fun, um, inspiring uh, uh, event. That's wonderful. I'm pausing just for a second and thinking yeah. about um, and thinking about your, your remarkable career, um, are there things we haven't talked about with your career that, that we should, uh, that, I've, that I've missed in my questions or that we've missed in our conversation? Well, um, well, there's various, well, let me, let's just, to me, one of the most important parts of my law practice are the lawyers that work for me and the leaders that they've become. Um, the founder of the Asian Pacific Bar Association, Lucy Denson, uh, was an associate in my firm. Um, the founder of the South Asian Bar Association, Neethi Pawar, was a lawyer and partner in my firm, and she became the first Asian American uh, Court of Appeals judge in March of 2019. Dan Sweetser, um, who's um, white, uh, who uh, uh, was a great, great lawyer who assisted me in our, rep in our work for the baseball stadium district in building Coors Field. Mm -hmm. uh, he um, was the president-elect of the Denver Bar Association and then has become the uh, deputy executive director of the Colorado Bar Association. Um, my partner, Michael DeManna, was a co-founder with me of the Colorado Criminal Defense Bar and was the president of the Arapaho County Bar Association. So I, I so one of the things I'm proud of is the, the leaders that were, that um, were groomed in my law firm, in our law firm. Um, you know, there have been, you know, thousands of cases I've worked on, um, but uh, in terms of impact on Colorado, uh, the work that I did for the baseball stadium district and acquiring the property for Coors Field uh, is, is important um, statewide. Mm -hmm. um, I served as uh, of counsel to the Denver City Attorney's Office under four different mayors, um, starting with Federico Pena, Wellington Webb, Hickenlooper, maybe it's just three different mayors. So I was of counsel uh, representing the city on conflict cases under okay. those three mayors. Um, and then um, during the last 10 years of my career, um, I did what was called attorney grievance work and representing judges on ethical issues. Mm. And so um, I became the lawyer for the lawyers, you know, on 
uh, ethical and eth ethics type issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought that that was important work. So that's some of the things that I did during my law practice. That's remarkable. Um, we've talked about Lincoln Hills. We've talked about your education. We've talked about your um, professional career. Are there other things that you want to that you want to share with us? Well, I have a. Um, stepson that graduated from CU Law School. So I'm, I'm no longer the only lawyer in the family. I have a daughter who is uh, got her master's degree and is a school counselor at, uh, at uh, Grayland um, Private School. Uh, what was fun about um, Tara is when I had my 50 year high school reunion at George Washington High School, she was the school counselor at George Washington High School. So uh, she got to uh, <clears throat> basically be the uh, um, spokesperson or for the, for the high school to our, our high school uh, 50 year um, anniversary celebration so i i it, it was fun to be sitting up in the uh in the gymnasium in the uh uh in the seats with my uh high school colleagues uh with tara uh, uh basically being the spokesperson for the school right so that was fun um I have uh, four grandchildren with uh, my oldest grandchild, who's now uh, 19 years old, who's uh, in engineering at CU Boulder. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, my mother, who we've only talked briefly about, uh, continues to be an inspiration because she's 96. Wow. She's still diary. She still has three computers <laughs> and she is uh, uh, continuing to, uh, um, as John Lewis would say, make good trouble, but she's doing that by Facebook, making good trouble. <laughs> um, she, uh, um, wrote her own uh, life story about 15 years ago and, and had it um, self-published um, called My Precious Memories. Hmm. Um, and so she's inspiring me to write my own story, which uh, I'm doing, I do a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, my sister, uh, who, uh, after her husband died of prostate cancer, mm -hmm. um, got her PhD from Johns Hopkins and she and I, uh, are working together on, uh, different presentations where we present uh, about uh, uh, Lincoln Hills and mm -hmm. North Cherry Creek. Uh, we've been asked to present to a woman's group at the Denver Country Club mm -hmm. coming up in December. Uh, this is a woman's group that uh, I just found out that the Denver Country Club is the oldest country club west of the Mississippi that was formed in 1895. Wow. And so uh, my sister and I will be talking about Lincoln Hills, which is the oldest black owned recreational area uh, to this group of women uh, at the Denver Country Club. Um, 
my brother um, uh, is also uh, an educator and uh, we, we talked about him having his uh, doctorate of education, but he's right now retired in Dallas and he's uh, the nanny of his four grand, I guess it's, is it called nanny? Uh, yeah, he's the nanny of his four grandchildren and uh, enjoying life in Dallas. Um, right now, I am uh, uh, working on obtaining a real estate license. So I'm going to real estate school so that uh, my wife who has a real estate company um, called Action Jackson Realty that I can become an executive with her real estate company. So I'm, I'm working on that. And uh, Regina has not only that business, but she has a business called Race to Dinner, mm. where she and her partner, uh, her business partner, who's a uh, East uh, Indian woman, mm -hmm. put on dinner parties uh, with seven or eight white women and they talk about racial issues and and how to uh, um, become anti-racist. And amazing. so, uh, so that's what she's that's uh, what she's doing. And uh, so, um, uh, with my work in the court system, mm -hmm. trying to increase the judicial diversity mm -hmm. within the court system. She and I are working side by side on uh, uh, important racial issues. Mm -hmm. And how, lo how long have you been married? 34 years. Mm -hmm. So 34 years. Yeah, that's wonderful. So um, uh, we've got lots of things going on. You do, I, and I, I don't expect you're going to slow down anytime soon from just having met you this afternoon. <laughs> okay, well, um, is there anything else you want to you want to share with us that that we've left out? Any advice you want to share with us, or thoughts that you want to close out with, or anything like that? I know I know we've been going for a while. I know, and I'm I'm sure you're you're tired. Um, but is there anything else you want to close out with or leave us with today? You know, uh, you know, I, you know, I think that we all need to do our part to uh, make this a, a better world, uh, to make it a, a more just world. And it's, it's my hope that what we're seeing uh, in the past year with the protests and the demonstrations that uh, uh, this is not just a moment in time, and we've gone through lots of different moments in time, mm -hmm. that this is more of a movement. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased that History Colorado is uh, involved in uh, um, what it's doing to expand its reach in terms of uh, uh, the other the other history makers mm -hmm. in Colorado in this world mm -hmm. um, that um, are sometimes not recognized. So. That's 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 what I would uh, end end with. Okay. You know, if um, if in going through your notes, if you think of things that you want to talk about on Thursday, mm -hmm. I've got us. Uh, I've got the time set set okay. off set apart. Okay. If 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 you want to do it, I absolutely do as well. I have my calendar blocked out for you for Thursday afternoon. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe we'll just both take the evening to think about other things that I'm we might want to uh, hear from you about, or other things that you just want. Like like you said, uh, mentioned toward the end, we haven't we didn't really talk about your mom. Um, you know, we, there's there's a lot of pieces of your life that we haven't talked about. So, um, and and I I'd love to have um, as comprehensive of an oral history from you as you wish to give us, um, because I really do in in just. The, the information you sent me and then the research I've done and then getting to spend this time with you just now, um, we have a lot we can learn from you. And, uh, and I think that, that, that your story is going to um, be meaningful to a lot of people. So I, I, um, I think that keeping that time open on Thursday, just spending a little time tonight uh, or the next, you know, tw you know, till tomorrow thinking about that um, and then touching base about maybe some of the other things that I'd like to hear or that you'd like to share um, would be a really great way to to regroup on for Thursday. Okay, well, I will. I'll think about it. Uh, um, I'm going to let you think about it more than I'm going to think about it. Okay. I'll be moving on. I know everything about everybody, so uh, uh, I because I'm just constantly curious. I, I collected my first oral history when I was 12, um, and and. Okay been collecting ever since. Um, so I, I I will go down rabbit holes with people. Um, so because I, I do think that um, your story is very inspiring to me. I'm, I'm one of these people that I, I find um, people who are who are in this world to lift up other people like you've been doing your whole life um, to just be very inspirational because that's something I try to do. Um, and so I always love to hear more about those about those folks and, and you're one of them and it's just really amazing to hear your story. Okay, well then I'll look forward to seeing you Thursday at, is it two o'clock or 2.30? 2.30. Same time. Uh, and we don't necessarily need to take the whole time on Thursday, but yeah, yeah let's read yeah. On Thursday. I, I, I think that what I've done is um, I've got an appointment at four o'clock. So okay. uh, we'll be uh, uh, in a short, you know, a short session. Okay, sounds good. Okay, okay. All right. well, Rachel, I, I enjoyed uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you found it interesting. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on Thursday. Okay, see you later. Bye bye.